Hello everyone, my name is Michael SK and welcome back to Umineko When They Cry Episode 2. So, the previous video was mostly dedicated to trying to figure out, alright, what happened with Jessica, what happened with Kanon, but more importantly, we're trying to clear his name. And in Story Battler came in with some pretty good ideas, but at the end of the day, we can't really pinpoint who we want to suspect. Everybody wants to already have an answer. Who's the one that killed Jessica? Who's the one that, you know, potentially killed Kanun? We know he's dead. That has been confirmed by Beatrice outside the scope of the story. But that's kind of what we were focus uh, focusing on in the previous video. Now going forward, we know that more people are going to die. Who's going to be targeted next? We haven't seen Kinzo in a while, and it's pretty, pretty likely, I would assume, that he is going to you know, disappear, similarly to episode one, because something happened. That little butterfly that attached itself to Rosa, I believe. I think that's kind of the key that is going to work with Beatrice's story as to, you know, what happened to Kinzo in episode one. I don't know. Either way, I'm sure we can all agree here that people are going to die. The what? As I was sitting lazily on the sofa with no desire to watch TV, Maria came over, pulled a picture book out of her handbag, and held it out to me. I don't think I know whatever this is. Wolves and sheep puzzle. It was a phrase that Aunt Rosa had said this morning when she had gone to call on Jessica. At the time, I hadn't known what it had meant, and right after that was that uproar when Jessica's corpse was found, so I had forgotten about it completely. The book that Maria held out to me looked like a foreign picture book or something that had been translated. When I opened it, I realized that it was a book stuffed with riddles. To the other side using one... Oh, okay. <laughs> Two opposing sides, basically, that have to, you know, be on the same boat. It was a very simple puzzle passed on from long ago. Let's try posing a question. On the right bank, there are th or two wolves and two sheep. There's a boat that has... Or that as many... There's a boat that as many as two, okay, what the fuck, as many as two animals can ride on and using it, you have to move all four of them to the opposite left bank. That's the puzzle. There are two rules. The first is regarding the boat. Even a single wolf or a single sheep can paddle it, but it can only t uh, hold two animals. The second rule is regarding the wolves. When they are greater in number than the sheep in any location, they attack the sheep and it's game over. For example, at the start of the game, let's say that the two sheep get in the boat and go to the other side. Then one sheep gets off and goes, or, and the other goes back to the first bank. When it does, there are two wolves on the first bank and a single sheep returns there. When that happens, the number of wolves is greater so the sheep is attacked and it's game over. On either bank, or even the boat, there must never be more wolves than sheep. And you've got to shuttle them all across under these conditions. By the way, the right answer is to move both wolves to the opposite bank in the first turn. Then one wolf comes back. On the second turn, you move two sheep to the opposite bank. Then one wolf comes back. Yeah, have the wolf do the work so that you're never having too many of wolves in one single area have them be the transporting ones, the moving ones. Then on the third turn, you put that last wolf that was on the right bank on the boat and cross to the opposite bank, and congratulations, transport successful. Partway, there may be the same number of wolves and sheep in the boat or on either side, but that isn't a problem. You only lose when the number of wolves is greater. This book uses wolves and sheep as an example, but lots of people probably know of this game using different characters. It looked like Maria wanted to test whether I, too, could solve the puzzles that she knew how to solve. And she kept showing me different pages, saying, Solve this one, and this one's hard. 
So what was happening when Aunt Rosa first mentioned this puzzle? That's right. When we decided to go and get Jessica, we talked about how many men should go. And Aunt Rosa mentioned the wolves and sheep puzzle, saying that we should all go together. <laughs> that can only mean one thing. Aunt Rosa was saying that there was a wolf among us. No shit. Among us. So, was she thinking that we would be safe if the number of wolves and sheep was in balance, but that the wolves would bear their fangs if the situation changed? At the time we found our parents' corpses, Aunt Rosa already suspected that the servants might be wolves. She sniffed out the possibility that, while she didn't know whether it was all of them or some of them, there were wolves hiding among them. That's no surprise. That murder scene was very elaborate. It's easy to imagine that there were multiple culprits. Honestly, if we want to think in terms of realism, it would be more plausible, more of a uh, potentially successful task of, you know, killing six people all in one, you know, night and to make it look as elaborate as that, to have multiple people involved instead of one person, because that really limits it to you know, what individual here can do all of that and get away with it? And because she had reached that conclusion, when we went to Jessica's room and learned that Jessica had been killed after being alone with a servant, Kanun, it isn't hard to imagine why Aunt Rosa suspected the servants so persistently. No, the, the servants are the wolves, but in this case, it's more of like a... If it's one-to-one, -one, then okay, well, the sheep is going to die. But if it's two and two... Maybe not as much, or maybe maybe if it is an equal number. Maybe if it is in this case. I, I think this puzzle, this idea here, can be manipulated a little bit, change the conditions a, a, just a, a slight bit here, because we don't really know what the full situation is. Honestly, there really shouldn't be an issue with that, but she wouldn't want that because she is picturing them as the wolves. This would create a one to three situation. Sorry, I mean one to four. I can't count. Yeah, sorry guys. It's like, it's two in the afternoon almost, but I had a crazy night last night. And lack of sleep, so... It'd be how it do, though. The servants put the dishes and empty cans on the serving cart and started to head out into the corridor. Behind them, Aunt Rosa was talking to Dr. Nanjo about something in a small voice. <sighs> she, God damn it, it's very similar to episode one. He is being suspected as well. <laughs> Dr. Nanjo closed the book he had been reading, rose from the sofa, and followed after the servants. I don't like that. I really don't like how this is now two for two and completely suspecting everybody on the outside of the family. Aunt Rosa stuck her head out into the hallway, and after seeing that they were completely out of sight, she closed the door and spoke. Mm? I don't like that. I really don't. I have to agree in a way with Battler that suspecting, you know, people close to us like that is very difficult. Because I've brought up also in episode one, it's really difficult to just suspect the servants. With that one sentence, Aunt Rose's gaze grew sharp. Apparently she had picked up on that sar or on the sarcasm. She laughed lightly. Oh yeah? Yeah, I mean, 
使用人たちがその一味であることを疑うことはできると思うの。Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to hear that reason. 兄さんたちが殺されていた最初の殺人、とても残酷な仕打ちがされていたわよね。Uh -huh. あれが一人でできる真似に見える。No, and, and like I said, I just brought it up. It's more plausible if we want to think in terms of realism, fuck the magic. Multiple people need to be involved for things to go as smoothly as it has in now two renditions of the story. That's a lot of people to, you know, to kill in such a fashion. Jessica Chan no hair no tobira or Megur Master Kin no Kenwa. She only no Dareka ga kakawati the shoko janai. There's more to it there. There has to be. Only the Master Key could have locked the door to Jessica's room. So we can only suppose that one of the servants did it. No. Wait. I kind of doubt that because you've been, like, really set on the idea that it's a servant here. セジョした人物は使用人を疑わせたくてマスターキーなしであの扉を閉めた。But I'm pretty sure we now know for a fact because of Beatrice's red text that it was indeed locked with a master key. でもそれは不可能でしょ ?That's right. If there existed some trick that could lock the door without a master key, that would make this a great disguise for casting doubt on the servants. If the culprit's goal was for us to isolate ourselves from the group so they could attack us one by one, this trick would also be effective at giving rise to paranoia. But there was no way to lock that door without using a master key. Master key will not be able to use the master key. Why are you not able to use the master key? Rudolf Nisa said that it was a good thing to use the master key. We don't have the idea that we don't have the idea that we don't have the master key. I mean, yeah, also consider episode one with the closed rooms trick, like, or the tricks that were involved with the closed rooms. There's always something else that could be going on that we just won't immediately think about because it's a trick. It's some sort of idea that we can't fully process immediately. So, yes, so that could tell. Somebody, Oracle, Utagawa Shikiba, Kuro. Yeah, but we've gotten rid of suspicions on him immediately. Yeah, let's set that up as a compliment. George Anaki realized she was referring to Aunt Eva and seemed a little uncertain about how he should take that sarcasm. Yeah, I'm with George here. I have no idea what, what these two are talking about. Yeah, what's the idea here? ジョージ君だって帰宅したら施錠するでしょつまみをひねってカチリとねえままさかいやでもカノン君の姿はどこにも兄貴にもピンときたみてえだなロザおばさんが室内を探したのはそういうことだ内側から鍵を閉めジェシカのポケットに鍵を突っ込んだカノン君がどこかに隠れて俺たちをやり過ごそうとしているのを探したんだ Again, and I've brought this up for like maybe two videos now. I feel like I've brought it up so many times. Is it not possible for this door to have been locked with the master key or locked in general while the door was still open? It was the simplest kind of closed room trick. It meant him hiding inside the closed room after the murder was committed. It's kind of like what they were assuming with Kinzo, that he was just like, you know, hiding underneath the bed or some shit. Then all he had to do was get out after those who discovered the body left, and the closed room murder would work perfectly. Yeah, 
Okay, but we know that there isn't. We know for a fact that there isn't. The only way in, you know, realistically is through the door. And yes, there is a window, but it's locked from the inside. Yes, you already said that. I'm I'm fully aware of that. そなたはカノンが犯人であると疑いそうになったため、真っ先にその可能性を潰すために。これ、分かっておる、分かっておる。だから、その次に考えたのはこうだった。あの部屋にいたのは実は三人だったという説だ。ジェシカとカノン君は
Oh, yeah, he's got bias for sure. I mean, the wolf or wolves could quite literally be in our group here, in the family. Okay, let me ask you this, Rosa. You think Kumasawa could carry out even a single murder? I mean, look at her. There's no way. And to do six of them? It's not happening. If she's in cahoots with somebody, then what is she even doing? What What is her job here in all of this? She's not committing a murder. But Goda, I, I don't want to suspect him. I mean, I did have some silly prediction in episode one. He definitely, he's he's a selfish person, 100%. I think even Beatrice said that he's selfish. But I don't think he would do it either. He doesn't seem to be the type. But we also don't know the servants as well as we do the family members. And even then, we don't even know the family members all too well. So that's actually the difficult part here. At the end of the day, we don't know any of these characters really well. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. The conditions can very well change. お父様のところへ源氏さんと一緒に行った。その時に孤立したはずなのに殺されなかった。源氏さんも狼ではないから。違うわ。二人とも狼だったからよ。Oh my god. Oh my god. Throw hands right here in the parlor. <笑>おばさん。私だって今の自分はあまり褒められたものじゃないとは思ってる。でもね、私は母なの。Hey, guess what? I don't care. Honestly, I kind of miss having Natsuhi as the, uh, as the one parent that got to, you know, survive all the, the first few deaths and all that. She was a little less bothersome. That's me putting it very, you know, nicely. Yeah, thanks. <笑>そりゃどうも。私はあなたたちの母として油断しないでと警告したかっただけなの。常に私の目の届くところにいて。I We can also flip it here. What if she's a wolf? What if she's a bad person? ついでに。and she's just leading us into danger. What if she's in cahoots with whoever the culprit is, like the main culprit? Yeah, there we go. There we have it. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, what you, what you doing? What you doing there, Rosa? Why, why are there so many like you know, CGs, you know, quote unquote, with a, a character holding a gun? Well, I guess now there's two, but then there was also Ava's where she was doing that thing with her fan and she was looking all weird. Anyways, she lifted her gun and pointed the barrel at me, but it was only for an instant. She immediately lowered the gun, laughing impishly. But to me, the time I spent staring down the barrel of that gun felt like an eternity. Yeah, 
to me, all that proves is that, okay, you've pretty much thrown yourself up to the top here. You're in charge. And it's your say, or there's no way, and everybody dies at your hands. No, that's a little sloppy, honestly. I feel like you're just trying to use this as an excuse because these previous murders, all eight of them, or seven to them, they don't know where Kanon is, they've been done skillfully in a way where nobody knows of the deaths until they actually come across the corpses. There's no way that it would be a loud commotion here. <laughs> nah, she's crazy. No, no, don't fucking believe in Kraus. That man's an idiot, too. All of you goddamn siblings. Maybe that's why I had, like, a little bit of faith in Natsuhi until the very end. Then a lot of my faith started to disappear. No, I don't want to. An unsatisfied expression rose to George Aniki's face. She literally insulted his fiance. I mean, no, he's not going to, you know, accept that. Not at all. He probably couldn't forgive the damage done to Shannon's honor. What about me? Several bits of circumstantial evidence hinted at the servant's participation. I didn't want to believe that one of them was the culprit, or possibly colluding with the culprit. But in our current situation, that was a little more than wishful thinking. Whom should I believe? In the first place, who's the culprit? Are there accomplices? And if so, how many? It seems I have only been suspecting the people we know. I quickly forgot that 19th person the guest, Beatrice, who arrived yesterday and boldly claimed to be the Golden Witch. Yeah, and she's, you know, somewhere here. She wasn't in her room, and she's just somewhere, right? In fact, I still haven't seen her face. I heard she greatly resembled the witch in the portrait, but since I haven't seen her directly, no matter how hard I try, it doesn't really feel to me like a 19th person is on the island. Excuse me. So I've been... Subconsciously hallucinating that the culprit's one of the 18. Damn it. I'm out, Beatrice. If you're the bad guy, then act like the bad guy and show yourself, laughing in a high-pitched voice and mocking us. That's actually what she does. Just like a bad guy in one of those dramas who, even when they're exposed as the culprit, aggressively says, Where's your proof? <laughs> well... There we go. Quite literally. We literally did a little... What the f... God damn it, game. That was it? That was the only reason we saw the, uh, the Beatrice and Battler conversation from outside the story? Was for that? There were five humans in the kitchen, but it was very quiet, filled only with the sound of the rain. It was only ex accented by the sound of Shannon and Kumasawa washing the dishes. Goda was using the leftovers from breakfast and lunch as ingredients for a soup. Rosa had suspected that poison might have been added to the food, so they decided to eat canned goods, but it hadn't been too satisfying. But Goda thought she was being too cautious, so he was spontaneously creating a soup to be served only to those who wanted some. That is fair, actually. Shannon and Kumasawa were washing the dishes, that the food had been arranged on. On the inside, they thought maybe Goda should wash them, since he had been the one who wanted the food arranged on plates in the first place. But they left their complaints unsaid for the time being. Yeah, might as well just do the work. Genji and Nanjo were facing each other across a crude chess set that had many years of experience. As they did in episode 1, I think. The game had still only just begun. 
and, be and because the opening game of these experienced players had been honed to perfection, it looked like a ceremony where they just moved specified pieces in a, spe in a specified order. I'm sure everyone is tired. <laughs> Rosa had fervently warned everyone that they didn't understand the danger that we were in, and that they must assume that poison was mixed in with the food. The mood of the time had led them to agree, but hunger wasn't something that could be swayed by a momentary emotion like that. <laughs> When Kumasawa cackled, Shannon and Gota laughed too. It seemed that in this space where only their fellow servants were gathered, they could relax quite a bit. Shannon didn't like Gota's occasional dishonesty, but she knew that there was no falsehood in his childish smile when he cooked, nor in his desire for people to enjoy his food. So even though it was a little aggravating to be made to wash the dishes, she couldn't really hate him. However, they couldn't have dreamed that Rosa was calling them wolves in the parlor at exactly the same moment that they were spending their time peacefully like this. Uh-oh. 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 What's, what's going to happen? I was actually just about to bring up after that line, but then the screen went black. I was... You know, thinking, this is a perfect opportunity to just wipe out five people. And eight plus five, there's our 13. We're done. All the deaths will have been accounted for. Just like that. And Kinzo will get to live. Cool. At that time, several of the servants heard a sound like something being dragged, and then a thump. It seemed like the sound made by a servant outside the back door when they were carrying a mountain of trash bags on a rainy day. Or maybe when a servant was returning from work wearing a raincoat. So at first, that sound didn't seem like anything out of the ordinary to any of them. But they soon realized, right now, everyone was either in the kitchen or in the parlor, so who could possibly be at the back door? Again, just like Battler was thinking to himself, he's been kind of forgetting that there is a 19th person here. As the servants all looked at each other, they checked to make sure that each one of them knew what that sound meant. The servants knew the mansion's layout well, so they understood how incomprehensible it would be for someone from the parlor to actually go outside in this typhoon, go all the way around, and come up to this back door. Then was it Kinzo? They couldn't imagine that Kinzo, who never left his study, would dash out into the middle of this typhoon, excuse me, and come to the back of the house where only low-class people ever entered or exited. <laughs> now every, everybody's on the same page here. <laughs> Poor Kumasawa. Shannon and Kumasawa drew close together, fearfully looking at the back door. Yeah, my ass is never <laughs> suspecting <laughs> Kumasawa. Like... Obviously, there's the argument that, like, oh, yeah, you, you know, you could be in cahoots with somebody and that somebody could be committing the murders and then you're just, like, an accomplice or whatever. But nah, not Kumasawa. Never. As Gota fearfully approached the back door, he called out. And his eyes flashed towards the butcher's knife that sat in a nearby sink. He didn't pick it up yet, because there was still a possibility that this was a member of the family. However, that possibility was impossible. There was no response from across the door to Gota's initial question. Maybe his voice had been so quiet that it hadn't reached through all the wind and rain outside. Are they still there? Genji took a knife with a classical design from a stationary box placed near the chess set. It was something to be used instead of a paper knife to open envelopes for statements of delivery and bills. But it was still a knife, so the blade on it could, you know, injure someone. Genji hid it in his sleeve with a well-practiced motion. God damn, Genji is just... 
He is so badass. I'm also never going to suspect him. Everybody else, including Shannon, and also all the family members, I will probably at one point suspect, but never Genji and never Kumasawa. And then he approached the back door himself, giving Gota a silent nod. Gota cautiously approached the back door and slowly started to open it. All right, who do we got out here? <laughs> Well, all right. The shadow of a person suddenly shuffled into sight, landed on its knees, and fell over. Gota fell backwards onto his backside and couldn't get up. I think we just came across Kanon. That human shadow was soaked with rain, smeared with mud, and drenched with blood. Or it's Kinzo. It's Kanon. Here we go. Kanon, Nanjo sensei. No, he's dead. He's straight up gone. It was Kanon. His breath was feeble, and the puddles of mud he left were quickly drenched bright red. When Nanjo held him, he turned him face up, and there was a deep, gruesome wound right in the center of his chest, as though he had been stabbed there by a spear or something. So the stake actually still isn't embedded in him. Interesting. Even now, deep red blood poured out from there. <gasps> I don't really think that's going to do too much, Kumasawa. Wait, is he still alive? Is he actually still alive? Wait, did he drag himself over? See, what I was picturing in my head was that somebody dragged him over. Oh, yeah, he is alive. Interesting. This is so weird. <laughs> Won't that like create more suspicion on the servants then because now they're going to be keeping secrets? He had told them not to tell Rosa right after appearing in this state. This could only mean something very disquieting. An eerie anxiety rose to their faces. <laughs> Gonna be another episode one situation where he dies before we can get him there. But we might be able to do something here. Surprisingly, he is alive. Kanun's wound was unbelievably deep. And judging from Nanjo's pale face, it was a miracle that he was still conscious. Yet yeah, I'm, even I'm surprised. The thing is, is that we were literally told that he had been killed in that room. We'd been told that with magic, he was Thanos snapped into a whole new dimension. He wasn't here in this world anymore. So this is betraying those two things. This is actually... This is actually going against the red text. He was not killed in that room. That's why I'm so dumbfounded. Actually, I guess you can argue that, like, he was, you know... Uh, injured enough to be in such a state to where he was going to die in that room. But I don't know. Now we're kind of like picking and choosing how we want to describe this. No matter how much Nanjo tried to wipe off that gushing deep red blood, he couldn't do it. Or he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't wipe it all away. All right. Each time and each time his wound was aggra or the wound was aggravated, causing Kanon to cry in anguish. Sorry, guys, I can't read. Terrible. Yep, he's gonna die. There's just no way. 
What does that mean? No. No. No, something's wrong here. This is not right. This is not right. Well, hold that thought, Goda. So, as I said earlier, we were given red text, an absolute, undeniable fact that Kaunun was killed in that room, right? We were told he was killed. Dead. And that he wasn't in this world anymore. Like, that was that was the magic part of this story. Or the, the that variation, if you will, Beatrice's side. So... What actually happened? Obviously, we can't really begin to describe what happened in that room. It's not possible. There's just... There's way too much going on. But I'm trying to think of the uh, the order of events here. Whenever the, uh, the the rest of the family and everybody got back to the, to the mansion, Rosa went up to Kinzo's room. That's where Shannon and Genji were with Kinzo. What if on her way... She went and visited Jessica. No, no, I, I don't think so. Because that happened way earlier. It had to have. I don't know. This is weird because now we're getting a whole new story that doesn't even fit a true fact that we were given here. This is odd. Well, cut off. This is, this is kind of messing with me. This is now betraying true facts. Unless what we have going on here is something different this might not be canon but I, I don't know this is this is just not right Th something is not right here something big disregarding nanjo and kumasawa who were struggling hard and strained with blood or stained with blood as they tried to stop the bleeding genji and gota faced each other because if what canon had said was the truth rosa was the culprit who killed jessica Hmm. Kanun screamed even more hatefully. His hate filled voice made it seem like he was seeing Jessica being harmed right before his eyes. Look, like, I'm very wary of her, just like anybody else, especially since she actually pointed that gun to Battler to make a point. But I don't know. Something is not right here. <laughs> Shannon suddenly ran out into the corridor. Her expression was complex and tragic, as though she didn't know what to believe. I don't even know what to believe. Ah, oh, fuck. We all know what this is going to do. It is going to create a true separation between the servants in Najo and against the Ishiramiya family. Shanun ran to where? The inside of the mansion had been scrupulously clean, so it probably wouldn't be easy to find. She might find it if she searched the Rose Garden, but they'd probably all been lost in this wind and rain. That's right. The boiler room isn't clean very often. If she went there, she might be able to find it. What is she looking for? Shanun ran downstairs to find that in the underground boiler room. What is she looking for? Did some medicine take effect in the brink or at the brink of death, or was Kanun finally beyond feeling pain? 
For the time being, at least Konun's painful gasping had subsided. Nanjo apparently didn't view this as a very good sign, and he didn't let his eyes off Konun. Or yeah, he didn't let his eyes off Konun for a second. Kumasawa firmly gripped Konun's hand and kept encouraging him so that the willpower keeping him alive didn't fade away. Genji and Gota seemed uncertain how to respond to the truth Konun had risked his life to deliver. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, power in numbers. この島には医者はいてもthat would actually be crazy if that was, you know, the truth. What if everybody in the parlor died? Because who do we have in the parlor? We have Battler, we have George, and we have Maria. And then, wait, hold on. I want to make sure I'm getting everybody because apparently I can't count today. Um, yeah, that's, that's all we have. We literally just have four. We have four people in the parlor. Honestly, our numbers are so small that, like, I was thinking in episode one, like, we had a lot of people there in that parlor until Ava and Hideyoshi decided, all right, we're gonna go die now. So, yeah, I mean, that could be four deaths right there. Maximum. <laughs> you know, fuck the five deaths I was just talking about over here with the servants in Nanjo. Now we can have four of them over there. そんな危険な相手なら無理に刺激しない方がいいんじゃありませんか。しかし明日までは長い。どんな手を打ってくるか想像もつきますよ。現地さん、こちらから仕掛ける I'd like to assume that we'd be able to, like, subdue her and, like, get rid of the gun before she actually uses all of those shots. Uh-oh. I really don't like how the screen will just go black and it's like, alright, cut the audio. Kanun, who they thought was sleeping quietly, suddenly started talking brightly, almost as though he had been awake this whole time and had suddenly opened his mouth. Kanun looked firmly or firm and steady, which relieved Nanjo a bit, but considering the depth of that wound, well, he couldn't wipe away a certain creepy feeling. He knew because he was a doctor. After losing so much blood, Kanun might easily have lost consciousness. And yet somehow he was still intensely aware of his surroundings. Was it youth? Or was it tenacity? Sometimes the power of human life surpassed common knowledge. No, definitely. Humans are fucking weird. While stopping the bleeding, Nanjo had groped around a bit inside the bleeding hole with tweezers, making sure that there were no foreign objects inside the affected area. And the great depth of the wound had shocked him. It had certainly reached as far as his lungs. And yet, and yet... No, but the fact that he's still alive is wonderful. But Kanun had spoke clearly. He'd hatefully stated that the one named Rosa made this wound, cursing and raging over and over and over. This is so... No, no, no. No, 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 game. We're not doing this. No, no, no. Hold on now. I know we were just here, but look. There is no corpse, but he is dead. He's dead. Look at this. The witch declared it in red. This is not Kanun. This is not... This is not our lad. This is not our boy. This... I don't know what this is. This is... This is wrong. And I've been saying that for a while now, but this is why. Oh, 
なんて人だ源氏さんどうしましょう私たちにも何か武器がいるのではにわかには信じられん王座様がそのようなことを源氏様信じる信じないじゃないあいつが僕にこの僕が聞いたんですどうして信じてくれないんですか、uh, when he opens his eyes, that sound effect. 起きないで傷に触りますカノン sat up on the bed speaking to Genji who didn't seem to be willing to believe カノン's story あいつは僕たちを必ず全員殺すもうきっと客間の方々も殺されているに違いありません僕らが先に殺さなければ必ず僕らが先に殺される僕が先に殺されたようにみんなも先に殺される Just like how I was killed first. 殺さなきゃ殺される殺さなきゃ This is not Kanon. Kanon san, Wanta, Honto ni itaku nai no ka? Ah, Kore desu ka? Taishita kizu jya arimasen. Taishita kizu jya nai dokoro ka? This is why Nanjo can't believe this shit. He's lost so much blood, he continues to lose blood, and he has this crazy wound. His lung is probably punctured. This man's a freaking zombie. Honto ni taishita kodo arimasen. こんなのもう全然痛くないし、本当に大した傷じゃない。As Kanon said that, he began to untie the bandages that had been painstakingly wrapped. The gruesome hole in his chest was immediately exposed. カ、カノンさん、そんなことをしてはダメですよ。早く横になって。大丈夫ですって。ほら、ね、大した傷じゃないでしょ。I think everybody here is about to die. Just straight up. This is definitely a trick of some sort. Very similar to whatever the fuck happened over in Jessica's room. Something crazy is going on here that we can't immediately explain. Kanun showed off his gaping wound, which was still slowly spitting out foamy blood. Everyone averted their eyes reflexively. <laughs> Bro, come on. I don't like that sound effect either. Kanun held up two fingers, showed them to everyone, and slowly started to stick them into the gruesome wound right in the center of his chest. Plunging, slimy, squishy, wet, the fingers went in deep all the way to their bases. Ugh. I don't like this. Those fingers were sticking all the way into his chest up to their bases, and then he slowly pulled them out in exactly the same way. The fingers he pulled out were stained a sticky, solid, deep red color, and there was even a thread hanging. The fingers were covered up to their bases in deep red. <laughs> I don't even know what to say anymore, guys. <laughs> yep, there we go. There we go. At that moment, the door was slammed open and Shannon appeared. Even after she saw Kanun stained with fresh blood, her impregnable expression didn't falter. <laughs> Oh, she's smart. She's really smart. It was only natural. Everyone believed he was Kanun, so they couldn't understand the meaning of Shannon's question. When they looked, they noticed that Shannon was holding a handkerchief in her hand. It was filthy and looked like it had been used to wipe up some trash or dust. And while holding that, she approached Kanun, drawing closer to his feet. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little curious too. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah, 
That's why she went to the boiler room. She was going to an area that wasn't really cleaned. Okay. When Shunun brought the handkerchief close to Kanun's thigh, something happened in an instant. It happened all at once. The human eye couldn't have followed it. Kanun jumped like a wild goat, fleeing from the thing Shunun was holding. Then from his arms, some kind of afterglow flashed purple and drew a curve through space. That arc, which drew three beautiful purple curves, traced across the throats of Najo and Kumasawa, who had been tending to him. God damn it. And in an instant, Najo's and Kumasawa's throats opened like gaping mouths, and then the blood really started spewing out. The third purple curve should have traced across Shunun's throat, but Shunun wasn't there. Because Genji, who had been behind her, had wrapped his own arm around Shunun's neck and pulled her back. This all happened in an instant. <laughs> in the instant, it took Gota to think fast in an attempt to you know, understand this scene, because even I'm not really fully understanding it. The frozen moment in time shattered. And those two are dead. Blood was gushing from Nanjo and Kumasawa's torn open necks. Kanun jumped and kicked off a picture frame that had been hanging from the wall behind him, springing forward just like a cat and aiming for Shunun's throat again. But Kanun's target once again disappeared from in front of him, because Genji had pulled Shunun again, and the two of them had fallen to the ground in a defensive crouch. <laughs> well, Goat is gonna die. Even Goto was no fool. Even if he couldn't fully understand what was going on, he at least realized that if this Kanun wasn't seized, his own life would also be in peril. He sprung at Kanun with his huge body, pushing him up against the wall with all of his weight and physical strength. Yeah, beat his undead ass. Damn. Another purple curve was drawn from the tips of the fingers on Kanun's right hand. And when he raised that hand like a sword, aiming for Gota's back, there was a loud thunk. Because Kanun's raised hand had been pinned to the wall, he couldn't tear his palm away from the wall. Sticking out from it was the knife Genji had thrown. Damn, Genji, you're fucking cool. Under normal circumstances, it would have been surprising to see someone as old as Genji handle a knife so skillfully. But in this abnormal space, no one paid, paid it much mind. Genji, <laughs> Genji took the handkerchief with the spider web stuck to it from Shanun, and he approached Kanun, who was pinned to the wall by Gota's massive body and the knife. <laughs> What the fuck is happening? Is this like a poison to him or some shit? Sorry guys, I don't understand curses and the uh and the undead or whatever. When Genji pushed the handkerchief up against Kanun's face, there was a sound just like setting meat on a red hot iron plate. Of course, the smell was the same too, as he was horribly burned, festering in filthy red and black, and crying out in his death throes, Kanun's body thrust open and scattered. Yep, there we go. It was almost as though a balloon filled with gold leaf had popped. The entire servant room was completely buried under a storm of gold leaf, no a cloud of gold butterflies. Now what? Is it over? Are we okay? Those butterflies began to softly fade as though into water, or rather into the empty air itself. And afterwards, all that was left was the three survivors sitting on their butts stained with blood. However, not everyone was merely stained with blood. Some of them were lying on the ground spurting out blood themselves. No, they're dead. There's, there's no saving them, honestly. Like, that is... Probably a surefire way of making sure somebody dies is slicing their throat like that. There's just no way. Slits so sharp they looked like they'd cut your finger if you touched them open wide, and large amounts of blood kept pouring out. 
The supernatural man. Yeah, all things considered, I'm very, very surprised that Goda is still with us here. Honestly, good question. Goda looked at his own hand. The bright red blood left from his scuffle with Kanun definitely remained, and yet Kanun was nowhere to be seen, because he had disappeared. He had transformed into gold butterflies and scattered. So something I've been thinking about for a couple of minutes here, I didn't want to bring it up because we were, you know, still in the middle of getting rid of Kanun, or the fake Kanun, or whatever the hell we just saw. Um, how are we going to explain all of this to, you know, everybody in the parlor? There is no way. This is also going to create such a split and a lot of distrust. I think a gun is going to be shot here shortly. Gota kept screaming alone without a clue about what was going on. Oh, here we go. We have deaths. Unfortunately, Kumasawa <laughs> couldn't save you yet again. Died in the servant room, her throat slit by a sharp blade or something similar. Finishing touches yet to come. And Nanjo, you know, same thing, but this alone isn't enough. Interesting. But we are now officially up to 10 deaths, which means there's three more that, you know, have to happen here, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, Shunun sobbed in front of Nanjo's and Kumasawa's remains as Genji watched over her silent as always. Oh, man. How are we getting out of this one? The clock is also getting closer to the, uh, to the screen there, which... If I recall in episode one... In episode one, that was really just showing how much closer we were getting to the, uh, to the end of it all. Up to midnight. So, what, this is chapter 14? We have to be getting closer to the end of this episode, I feel. Uh, I, you know what? Ah, shoot. Okay, a little bit more. Yeah, for real. Honestly, props to Shannon. She is goddamn smart. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> well... Yeah, that's the big problem here. Well, this also goes a little bit further, Battler. This is crazy. The thing is, let's put ourselves in everybody else's shoes here in the parlor. Let's say all of that that just went down, we didn't witness it. We get to the next chapter, we find out Kumasawa and Najo have been killed. Their necks sliced open by, you know, the murderer, the culprit, potentially. And for Gota, Genji, and Shenun to come back, and they were right there, they state that they were right there, they saw it happen, and they can't explain it? Yeah, that's going to cause some suspicion right away, 100%. Dr. Nanjo and Kumasawa-san had been killed. We understood that much, and it seemed that it had occurred in front of these people's eyes. But even so, they spoke awkwardly. They admitted that they had definitely seen the crime with their own eyes, but when asked to explain what they had seen, their mouths went suddenly shut. I could understand why Aunt Rosa was irritated and flaring up. But she wanted answers. <laughs> Interesting that they're not stating who it was immediately. 
But the thing is, is that I'm sure they're all pretty much coming to the same conclusion. That was not Kanun. The way that they can't really piece the story together, like, sure, that's going to seem suspicious, but when things that are so incomprehensible occur right before you, you can't piece it together. The words will not immediately come together. If it's an event that, you know, uses, you know, reality, the, you know, laws of physics and everything else that we're used to in our lives, reality, you could probably piece things together a lot easier is what I'm trying to say. But here, where, you know, crazy sci-fi bullshit just went down, no, you can't piece that together easily. Especially if you want it to be believable. In a manner that didn't match his large body, Gota held his head and scratched at it. I didn't have a clue if he was confused because he couldn't remember, or because he had seen something terrifying and could not accept it. And Shanun looked the same way. If she let her guard down, what she had seen just a short while ago would quickly melt away like a daydream and she wouldn't be able to remember anything. That's what she looked like. Only Genji looked composed as usual, which is crazy, but again, Genji's a badass, I'm sure we can all agree, so the questions were naturally directed at him. However, even Genji took quite some time before he spoke, and he had to gather his thoughts. Genji -san, you well, hold the fuck on, Rosa. Oh, yeah, she does. If we gave their claims the benefit of the doubt, it means that Aunt Rosa's first conclusion was correct. Hmm. Kanun had appeared near the back door to the kitchen with a serious injury. Then he had been taken to the servant room and cared for. And after that, something terrifying had happened. So were these people so convinced that Kanun Kun couldn't possibly have done such a thing? That they'd started to suspect whether it had been or even been Kanun Kun at all? In other words, that means Kanun Kun did appear. No matter how confused they are, no matter how they muddle their words, that's what it means in the end. So does that mean, after all, Kanun Kun used some trick to escape that room even though it was locked? No, that doesn't matter anymore. The real problem is that Dr. Nanjo and Kumasawa-san were killed. Aunt Rosa has claimed that Kanun Kun was behind this from the very beginning. No matter how confused these people are, no matter how much they tried to deny it, they're halfway confirming that she was right. But even so, for some reason, I felt like their awkwardness couldn't be explained by confusion alone. What did they see? Like they said, did they really see something that couldn't be explained with words? Basically, kind of what we got here was the end of episode one, right? Like, at the end of episode one, we had all the servants in Nanjo that were still alive, and Maria pretty much thrown out of Kinzo's study, which was the safe room, into the parlor, and they were all killed minus Maria. We don't know what really went down there except for what Maria told everybody. So, this kind of gave us some insight into the wacky bullshit that Beatrice is trying to, you know, hold dear as the true direction of the story. Which we don't want, obviously. But that's the only, you know, direction I can really piece this to, is that all of these killings that we've had the opportunity to see are through ridiculous methods that are hard to, you know, connect to a real, you know, murder. Just a regular can be done without magic and other sci-fi bullshit type of murder. It's working against, against our claims, or at least Battler's claims, that magic isn't real, that the witch isn't real. Anyways, we're going to save it there because my brain hurt. And I have no idea what the fuck just happened. 
So we're in chapter 14, not chapter 13, excuse me. Uh, I, I don't know what chapter I said just a little bit ago, but no, we are we are making great strides here, and I don't know how much more we have left, but I mean, there's not too many people left either. That's also a really good telltale sign that we're getting closer to the end again, but we need to keep a keen eye, or at least I do. I need to keep my eyes open for any hints to anything different that we did not immediately pick up in episode one that can try to, you know, keep the, the gears in the head spinning. We got to come up with something here at the end. Otherwise, it's just another crazy killing spree all the way to midnight. Anyways, thank you all for watching this one. It was wild. And if you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take it easy.